Hello, I'm Bob Norton, CEO of Airtight Management and creator of the CEO and Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. This segment is on innovation and disruption, which require different kind of treatment and different kinds of thinking and even different resources. The agenda for this segment is to talk about culture and philosophy for innovation. And this might sound abstract or too philosophical, but the fact of the matter is culture is what drives innovation. And we'll get into a lot about why that is true and that the culture is the foundation of your ability to create new innovation. Second agenda item is understanding some of the best practices in innovation. In fact, innovation is a disciplined process combined with the creativity of the mind. We'll talk a little bit about the, the differences between uh, creativity and innovation and disruption. And we're going to talk about uh, many ways to innovate because there are literally checklists that can be very helpful. And it's very important not to think of innovation as only something that's done in a product or service. You can actually innovate in all kinds of areas of the business, and we'll talk about case studies and businesses that have grown to multi-billion dollar businesses by a little tweak in an area that isn't even the product. It's about distribution or something else. I'm going to document and, and sort of fly through a whole bunch of flow charts for processes for innovation so that you can pick the ones that work best in your business and adapt to your situation. And I, I think you'll find that there are a lot of tools here, and the goal is to innovate at a much higher rate than your competitors. And in fact, when you do these processes right, as you'll see in our product development section, you can literally get 10x improvement over your average company out there in terms of innovation. So an interesting background is that in 1899, the head uh, of a commissioner of the Patent and Trademark Office, shamefully, Charles Duell, said that everything that can be invented has been invented. And it's important and interesting to look at why he was so wrong, and in fact is the opposite of what in fact the case is. And of course, every year, we come out with new and massive innovations. This was over 100 years ago. And every new technology that's created actually creates thousands upon thousands of innovation opportunities. And we'll look at a tool called the Innovation Matrix where you can take that new technology and put it across different industries, niches, market segments, or products and add that new technology. So in fact, the number of innovations are increasing exponentially with time because of all the different sorts of permutations that you can have. So this is a perfect example of the lack of creativity and incompetence really in vision in government where they actually claimed the total opposite of what in fact would be happening in the future. Now, there's a great book that's a bit of a mind blower, and if you're interested in the long-term future and, and visionary stuff, I recommend reading the book Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler. It talks about how the combinations of different technologies, specifically biotechnology, nanotechnology, and computer technology, will create things that we can only imagine or, or are in science fiction today. In fact, one of the mind-blowing examples is that someday we'll be able to back a truck of garbage up to an empty lot, dump that garbage or the raw materials, seed it with a nanorobot, and in fact build a perfect house because that nanorobot will use the raw materials to build other nanorobots, which will build a perfect house by the design right down to the molecular level. So perfect, meaning truly perfect, down to the atom, because the nanobots will be able to place individual molecules and atoms manually. And of course, there'll be millions, if not trillions or billions of them to do that. So, you know, it, it's, it's unbelievable that anyone would think that innovation 
is in fact done. It's, it's accelerating every year. So today, in fact, you have to innovate or die. Everyone must innovate or they will be innovated by others out of business. Product life cycles are shrinking. And so innovation, and Peter Drucker has a famous quote about this, that the only two core competencies of a business are innovation and marketing. And technology will only accelerate this need over time because of all these permutations that will cause almost infinite number of product and service possibilities. A few of these are protected, a few areas are protected from leapfrogging and, and uh, paradigm shifts. And so if you don't innovate, your competitors will essentially eat your lunch over time. Innovation and constant improvement really have to be built into the foundation of any culture. So a couple good examples and famous quotes, I have hundreds of these that I, I like to use that really make you think about this. Uh, and Henry Ford in particular said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse, right? And what this is hammering home is the idea of a disruption. And a disruption is something that's such a leapfrog over the way things are currently done, it can't possibly be in the mind of the average person. It's our job and the creative people's job to in product innovation to really create these disruptions. So you can't expect your prospects to have that vision of the future. They may be able to provide you incremental improvements and product ideas, but that's very different than a disruptive leap and a, a new vision for a solution. Incrementally, it's important that you can expect your prospects to have those kind of push the margins a little bit idea, the evolutionary ideas, but not the disruptive ones. So building a high growth business is really all about innovation because as you probably learned in the boot camp already, probably the most important word in making a business successful is differentiation. Right? And innovation is just the verb or the action of creating differentiation because if you're putting something new in the marketplace, your competitors don't have it. So by definition, you're differentiated. So here's a chart that, that just shows, and I won't read you this, you can pause and study this for a minute and just understand that all of the best growth businesses are innovating. They're market innovators, 70% of the top growth businesses have some sort of market innovation going on. The 55 or 56 percent are going to have high support for risk taking, right? And risk taking, as we've already talked about in the risk mapping and landscape segment, is kind of the other side of the coin of innovation. You really can't push the boundaries and try new things without taking risk and having failure. So failure needs to be built in as part of the culture, but you want to fail rapidly and cheaply and quickly. Uh, in listening to customers, 52.9% of the top growth companies specifically make it part of their culture to listen to customers very well because that's what will drive sort of those incremental changes in growth even though they won't probably won't drive the main disruptive ones so let's blow away a common myth about entrepreneurship and that is an idea is worth something in fact an idea is literally worth zero and so when people say i have a million dollar idea they really don't understand entrepreneurship. They really don't understand the legal aspects or the business aspects of building a company. Because ideas a dime a dozen. The, the, pretty much every idea ever turned into a successful company was had by hundreds, if not many thousands of people. But they didn't have the skill set. They didn't have the team. They weren't willing to take the risk. They didn't invest the capital. They didn't make the marketing and the sales and the operations and everything else work. And, and so you really can't say an idea is worth anything. In fact, the empirical proof of that is that even a patent 
which is the exclusive right to implement an idea in a particular way. You'll learn in the IP segment that you can't patent an idea. You can only patent a way of implementing an idea, and there may be many, many ways of implementing an idea. So that's why most patents are worthless. But even if you have the only patent in the world to do something a particular way, or what's called a picket fence strategy, which is a whole series of patents surrounding all the ways to do that, your idea is only worth 2 to 5% of the business. And that's if you have a patent. And of course, that's limited to about 17 years. Of course, you know, the rules vary a little bit around the globe. But in the U.S., the Patent and Trademark Office, it's typically a 17-year time frame that you're protected on that idea. And the reality is you have to disclose that idea and, and the way to implement it to everyone in advance. So there are times when you want to keep some ideas as a trade secret so that it can maintain a much longer life of exclusivity for you and differentiation. And third, most ideas don't turn out to be good businesses. We know that trial and error is a very large part of entrepreneurship and that 80 to 90 percent of companies and 95 percent of products, you know, pretty much one in 20 will be successful. And so you have to rapid fire many ideas and trials, and that means you need a process to do that quickly and in a systematic way. So statistically speaking, ideas are almost worthless, and anyone that says, I've got a million ideas, probably will never be successful turning that idea into a business because they really don't understand that concept.